Hello, everybody. Welcome to Antiques, History, and Loomis. I'm Frank Farmer Loomis, and I'm the antique, and I hope a little history. Today we're at the Cincinnati Art Museum. And you know, in the late 1800s, we think of the late Victorian era as the Gilded Age, and it certainly was. But you know, it had another name. It was called the Age of Museums in the United States. And before we look at the dates for some of the great museums in the United States, let's go across the big pond, the Atlantic, to Paris, France, and the Louvre Museum in the heart of Paris, which was, had one time been the home of the French monarchy, was one of the very first art museums to be opened up to the public. Now this may shock you, but it was Louis XVI who suggested that the Louvre, which wasn't used during his lifetime very much, be open to the public and show the royal collection of paintings. Now that is the truth. Joseph Cronin wrote that in his biography of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. The revolutionaries don't like you to know that, but God loved King Louis. He started it. In the United States, in the Gilded Age, the Victorian era, the Metropolitan Museum of Art was started in 1870. You've probably have seen that in New York City on Fifth Avenue. The Art Institute of Chicago, 1879. The Philadelphia Museum of Art, 1876 for the Centennial. And right here, the Cincinnati Art Museum, 1881, was founded. So go visit art museums. I always have wonderful memories as a child. My, gram, my grandmother took me to the Art Institute of Chicago as a child, and I always have fond memories. Take your children, the future antiquers and everything. And today, for Keep Antiquing, and for Antiques History in Loomis, we are going to visit an incredible exhibition of Thomas Gainsborough's paintings, and I know you're gonna enjoy it. Welcome to Antiques History in Loomis, and as I said earlier, we're at the Cincinnati Art Museum, and we've got a great interview scheduled for you today. But first, let me introduce Dr. Benedict Lecca, my pal here at the Cincinnati Art Museum. He's been on the radio show. Benedict, tell us what you're the curator, because you're, you're, you're everywhere here. I am the curator of European painting, sculpture, and drawings, everything European from medieval to World War II. You're busy, aren't you? And you're particularly proud here in the Thomas R. Schiff ex Exhibition Hall here, this beautiful lady behind us. Who's the artist here? Uh, Thomas Gainsborough, the, one of the great portraitists in the Western tradition, one of the signal artists of the 18th century, and one of the great, great British painters of all times. I wish you liked him more. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, what's the, tell us a little bit about the background of Gainsborough, because it looks like these beautiful ladies here. He loved the ladies. Uh, it's true, he did indeed love the ladies. Uh, he is uh, certainly one of the canonical artists in the Western tradition in all the art history books. Uh, one of the great, great portraitists in the history of Western painting. Uh, he's born in 1727, uh, first really makes his career in Bath in central England as a fashionable portraitist, eventually moves to England where he becomes one of the premier artists of the 18th century. Him and uh, Joshua Reynolds were the two great rivals who are essentially the Matisse and Picasso of their age. The Matisse and Picasso, of their, that's great. Now I know when we were getting ready and talking to you about it, you're very passionate because the Cincinnati Art Museum has something really neat to claim about Gainsborough, doesn't that's it? That's true. Uh, we were the very first museum in the country to put on a Gainsborough exhibition in 1931. Yeah, the very yeah, yeah. first museum in the world to put on a Gainsborough retrospective, that same show in 1931. If you look at the uh, yet unsurpassed catalog raising in 1958 by Ellis Waterhouse, a long deceased grandmaster of British 18th century painting, he lists all of the significant um, Gainsborough exhibitions dating back to 1840. Every one of them is in England except for Cincinnati 1931. Yeah. Uh, a show that included no less than 10 pictures from Cincinnati collections. Wow. And when you say catalog raisonné, that means all the works that Gainsborough did? That's right. All of the pictures thus far repertoried uh, by Gainsborough uh, now numbering over 1,200. Over 1,200 in a lifetime. So he became rich and famous then? Uh, he was certainly one of the top drawer portraitists, made a very good living, no question about it. Good for him. And we picked four out of this exhibition today. And Benedict, this beautiful lady behind us, that's Mrs. Richard Sheridan. Richard Brinsley Sheridan. This is uh, a late Gainsborough. Uh, it belongs to the National Gallery in Washington. Uh, and this is one of the great pictures by Gainsborough, widely believed to be his masterpiece even. It is newly cleaned by our friends at the National Gallery, so we're the very first people to benefit. Uh, of, and looking at it. Uh, here we have Gainsborough engaging with some very serious uh, philosophical issues. You'll notice first 
the preponderance of the landscape in relation to the figure. We know Gainsborough would rather have been painting landscapes. He tells us in one of his letters where he says that people would just let me alone with their damn faces. And when you know what <laughs> the life of a portraitist in the 18th century, you know from the surviving account books by Joshua Reynolds, he would start painting at 8 in the morning, finish at 4 in the afternoon. Uh, so it's a very, uh, anyways, um, Gainsborough here is engaging with all sorts of changing concepts of nature in the 18th century. When you think about up until the 18th century, nature is seen as a more or less, and I'm speaking roughly in broad sure, strokes, like, right. a static system um, as a visible expression of theological truths derived from the Bible. And in the 18th century, nature is reconceived as a dynamic system in which man fits in it. Can I ask you then, does that mean that in the 1700s they would paint maybe with the leaves on a tree less rigid, maybe blowing a little bit in the wind, or is that a bad way of explaining uh, that? It, yes, I mean, bad what, way? We, what okay. we're seeing here is, is a relationship between okay. man and nature, and that's the point. Mm -hmm. She is, for example, not stiffly attired and standing, but she is reclining informally. That's one of the hallmarks of modernist portraiture. Uh, note the crescent shape, which is echoed in the mm -hmm. crescent shape in the background. She's okay. pretty beautiful. And she's, what did she do in life? Because he was famous for a um, certain type of ladies. She was a family friend. She was a noted soprano, so she was a musician. And uh, by this time, of course, she was married. And um, this is just one of the signal portraits that he painted of somebody that he knew well. And that, that's one of the theses of the show, is that these portraits are the result of a very special relationship uh, between the artist and women that he knew very well. And, and that's why it just blows my mind away. I'm not arguing with you when you say that he'd rather have done lands, painted landscapes, because I thought, you know, the ladies loved him. And well, he... you know, <laughs> trees don't complain that you got the wrong shade of green on their leaves. Trees and, don't uh, complain, yeah, and, that's true. Uh, so when you think about the portrait, the interchange of the portrait event, you know, it happened often that people would say, you know, this is a bad likeness, even though Gainsborough was known to capture an incredible likeness. As I look at your wonderful book here, Thomas Gainsborough and the Modern Woman that you wrote, um, I keep thinking, I know it's trite, but I keep thinking of that movie, The Duchess, a few years back. They all look like, uh, who's that beautiful movie star that was in that? Kira Knightley. Kira Knightley. Did you, did you see that movie? Yes, I did. Boy, the furniture and the paintings in that house were great. You know, when we were on the radio show, Benedict taught me something really, really interesting, and I, I'm, I'm gonna shut up, I'm gonna ask you two questions. The fluid br br brush strokes, but the other thing was, you were telling me how they would take the portraits and they would display them very uniquely. And I think that's fascinating for all of us. It is no. true that before television and cable, uh, people looked at portraits differently than we do today. Uh, they, they were, in, in effect, when you have a life-size portrait of this scale, their life like, their life size, you're meant to have a physical reaction to them, uh, notably an erotic one when you're dealing with beautiful women. <laughs> Uh, and um, certainly they interacted with portraits in, in a very uh, personal way, a very physical way, unlike us. As far as the paint handling, Gainsborough has been said is the first impressionist. Look at this Yay! passage right here, which yeah. is at the dead center of the painting. He wants you to notice that. And it's not an accident that the very first image that I show in the catalog is that dynamic brushwork in the background. And look at that little drip of paint up top at the middle uh -huh. there. It's dripping down. He could have erased that. The point that I'm making, one of the points that I'm making in this show is that Gainsborough belongs in that lineage of modernist painters. So you can draw a line between Gainsborough in the 18th century to Monet in the 1860s. Wow, yeah. To Jackson Pollock. Why not? Because we're talking about an artist who's making a statement about the poetic and expressive potentialities of paint on its own terms, divorced from the usual requirement of a portrait, which is to capture a likeness. He's not just painting a face. He's making a statement about the expressive potential of paint of paint as an act, painting as an activity and of perception itself. It's beautiful and that scarf is exactly like you're, is you're saying, so impressionistic. Now we're right across is the Cincinnati Art Museum's, one of its great paintings, right? And is that, that's Anne Ford? Anne Ford painted in 1760 in Bath, essentially the, the painting that puts Gainsborough on the map. It is at that time that he decides that he is going to step up his game, so to speak, and really become a major artist and make a major painterly statement. And he does that by painting this young woman uh, in an unconventional pose. She is surrounded by the attributes of her professional ambition, the viola da gamba, the guitar. She wrote important books. And keep in mind the place of the woman in the 18th century. You're meant to be your steer towards hearth and home. She is performing publicly in the 1760s, caused a sensation. Her father blockaded the performance hall. And uh, this is how Gainsborough, who was very much a, an oppositional artist, a maverick, uh, this is how he 
played out this kind of oppositional stance by painting provocative women provocatively. Well, when, when I look at that painting there, was that painting in the 1931 exhibit? Was it part of the collection? Absolutely, hey, sure. Hey, okay, a trailblazer. Absolutely. And then you use the word provocative. Let's go into that, because in here you talk about that in your book. Demi reps, reps. Women Demi with reps. the compromised reputation, that is an 18th century term. And uh, what's fascinating is that in the 1931 exhibition, none of these paintings were in the show except for ours and the one from San Francisco. Clearly at that time, uh, there was a desire to present Gainsborough very much as the tame grand master, as opposed to... Um, he was not, a, he, in other words, they were trying to puritanize him? Sure, absolutely. This is so funny because we always think of the English as stiff up our lip and, you know, blah, well, blah, we're blah. we're talking about Cincinnati here. Yeah, well, that's true, but I mean, but the British weren't that, he, he knew how to have a good time. Uh, absolutely. How long, if this is an unfair question, but it's amazing, the, that must have been very labor intensive to do that Ann Ford portrait. Anytime you're doing large scale portraits of this kind, you're dealing with a lot of work. It's, people ask me that a lot. I would estimate anywhere between four and six sittings of a couple hours. We know from the account books of Romney, for example, that one woman came to the studio and it took her four sittings before she decided on a posture. And we know Reynolds, for example, had a book of reproductive engravings where you could come in and pick a posture. It's like going to the hair salon and saying, make me look like this girl. Oh. And so, uh, but this one, it's clear that he knew her well. And he, at one point, he picked up his iPhone and called her and said, come over, we'll do something very radical. I love it because she's not, you know, I forget the book that I read, but they pointed out, oh, a book by Dr. Joan Dijon. She said how the French invented comfort, and she, and she makes this generalization, not to critique her, that the British were more rigid in their paintings and stuff. This destroys that whole myth because she's literally kind of laid back, isn't well, she? And Gainsborough was criticized in terms of a very French-like painting. I mean, yeah, you know, can't go wrong with that, right? If you look at this one, it recalls the Fête Galante Vato, these kind of, you know, green settings. Happy scenes out at uh, Versailles, sort of? Uh, more or less. More yeah. or le no, less. Yeah. Tell me what they really are there. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> You're so diplomatic. Uh, Amorous. Uh, well, that's happy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, sure. Any now, we have a couple more paintings that you picked out for History, Antiques, and Loomis today, and tell us about those. The Giovanna Bocelli from Tate Britain, one of the fabulous pictures painted in 1782, caused a sensation at the Royal Academy exhibition. If you look at that picture, when you think about the gendering of 18th century portrait painting, by and large, you're dealing with closed composition, demure attitudes, stable postures. And here she is, a young dancer, already one of those problematic women. Uh, she's not <laughs> stable, she's dancing. She's dancing right out of the picture plane into your space as a viewer. And note what she's holding up. She is holding up a uh, a sheer veil made up of a profusion of strokes which is absolutely antithetical to academic painting. So you know when Reynolds walks in to the Royal Academy exhibition in 1782 and sees an Italian dancer dancing with rouge makeup holding up a sheer veil that kind of evasive to the touch and to the eye, the, the kind of the, the signal um, accessory of womanhood which speaks of masquerade, the uh, makeup, we know she wasn't Rebecca from Sunnybrook Farm. Yes, in exactly. And so Gainsborough knew well that he was going to get a response on those terms. So. And um, well, a couple more paintings you picked out here, which is uh, besides Anne Ford, did, uh, Sarah Siddons, did Sarah you? Sarah Siddons, uh, certainly one of the great, great portraits in the Western tradition. Uh, that picture was painted as a retort to the very famous Reynolds portrait of the uh, same sitter, Mrs. Siddons, as the tragic muse. And keep in mind that Gainsborough and Reynolds are those two great masters that are dialoguing very seriously in the 18th century about what British painting should be and should look like. You said the Matisse and Picasso exactly. of Britain in the 1700s. Exactly. And, and you know, she looks so much like the, the, the actress that played Duchess. Sure, and the, the difference there, of course, is that Gainsborough is retorting specifically to the grand manner of Reynolds. Right. He is wanting to show Mrs. Sins as a fashion plate of the moment, literally. Well, so. but we're going to talk later on about the fashion thing. Benedict, do you feel that Gainsborough is still timeless for us? Absolutely. He is one of the, it's really at a moment in the history of Western painting where uh, we're talking about an artist who's, like I said, no longer just painting a face, but making a statement about painting itself and about perception. So this idea of, you know, he's, he's, we're talking about an artist who's not just painting what he's seeing, he's making a statement about what he's doing. And that is extremely important because it's, it certifies that he belongs in that lineage of the modernist painters who become self-critical and self-aware of method in relation to practice 
and takes uh, portraiture to a whole different level. I love how you explained all of that to us today about the impressionistic approach. And I love they were the Mat Romney and Gainsborough were the Matisse and the Picasso of the 1700s. We won't go which one was which. But anyway, Benedict, thank you thank for you being so on uh, our show today. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. You know, standing here in the gallery with all these beautiful ladies, and this beautiful lady next to me is Barbara Baxter, and with her permission, I like to call her our antique Vanna. Barbara, aren't these women all beautiful? They are, Frank, and I want to thank you for the compliment, the, the one about being the beautiful lady. Well, yeah, what the heck are you wearing? I know you got that on purpose, <laughs> and it is, I'm just kidding, everybody. Tell us about the hat. Okay, I'm wearing this hat because Gainsborough painted many women uh, in hats, and I love hats, and also because Gainsborough's family was in the textile business. I know you knew that. No, 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 you told me about it. It makes sense, though, because he painted all these beautiful he ladies. He did, and the interesting thing to me, because I like hats so much, is because his family was in the textile business, he was very aware of fashion, of current fashion, which makes sense. He grew up with it. It certainly does. And that hat, I think I remember reading in a 1930s movie uh, magazine that Norma Shear, the big 1930s movie star, sort of made a hat like that famous, and they called it a Gainsborough hat, like Sarah Siddons is wearing here. Is that, is exactly. that true? Exactly. And did you make that? I did, Frank. I bought the form, and then I added all this wonderful stuff. I got a dumb question, but okay. inspire another one. Yeah, another one. Okay. Could this be a hat one could uh, you could wear for Derby Day, or does it have to be black or totally yes, white? Yes, you could wear this for Derby, definitely. So it shows the timelessness of Mr. Gainsborough again. And it's also a good hat for Derby because the horses come from the left. Not too many mint juleps, so you might lose that hat. This is true. And you know something else that I think is particularly interesting is Gainsborough painted from fashion dolls. Now, mm. fashion dolls were little dolls that were dressed in the fashion of the day, and he could use those as models for the fabrics and the dresses that he was painting in some of these portraits. And I brought a beautiful fashion doll this gorgeous doll is a Barbie doll, and she is a fashion doll of today. And she is wearing an outfit by the designer Byron Lars. And Byron is a current designer. And look at her hat. Mr. Gainsborough I would be pleased. So. When yes, he... I now, think Byron was definitely inspired by Gainsborough. Now, this is a new Barbie? This is a new Not Barbie. to get temperamental about her age, but the original Barbies are great examples of mid-century antiques. And she'll be an That's antique, right. sorry Barbie, and sorry Barbie, she'll be an antique maybe in 20 years or something and, like that. And I'm already an antique. Well, you're right, both of us are. What do you mean, right? <laughs> so. Tell us now, did you plan your whole outfit around that hat? I did. Now look at Sarah Siddons there. She would readily approve, wouldn't she? That's Sarah. She's on my side, I can tell you. She was a great actress. And you can see in the background here, she's sitting in a, a very beautiful wooden armchair that is exposed. It looks like red velvet, and it's probably a Louis XV armchair that she's sitting in. She, she just looks like that movie, The Duchess. That's what Benedict and I were saying earlier. And she so reminds me of Marie Antoinette. Do you, do you see that similarity? I do, Frank. And I think it's interesting also that the women of this era wore wigs. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. when you consider how high and full the hair is in these portraits, those were definitely wigs. And they even would shave their heads very close to, their, to the hairline mm -hmm. so that they could put these wigs on. And then on top of that, they would wear these hats. So you can imagine the weight that they were carrying around. You know, and we forget about all this, but we're like when you watch that TV series, uh, Mad Men, that takes place in the 1960s, ladies went around with hats like that, didn't they? And, and you, you lady, well, you're too young, but the ladies would wear gloves and everything. How thing, you think that it'll, pendulum will ever swing back where the ladies will be wearing hats all the time and the gloves, or do you, and the men wore hats a lot too, or do you think that's well, sort of? I can tell you that there are a lot more women wearing hats now than there were 10 years ago. And they're very, very cute hats. In fact, young women like to wear hats. They wear little cocktail hats. They wear hats when they're walking around in their winter coats. So I think there is, there is a resurgence of interest in hats, and let's just hope that they're being inspired by Gainsborough. Yeah, I'm right, because as we look around here, Sarah, the great actress, is wearing a hat. Do you know the story about her? There's this, she was an actress, obviously, like Benedict said, and she 
was painted by another artist, Mr. Romney, seated in a chair looking like a Greek goddess or a Roman goddess. And when they made the 1950 movie All About Eve with Bette Davis and Ann Baxter, they present the Sarah Siddons Award for acting. And it was the, the lady's face and everything, not based on this painting, but the Sarah Siddons, the actress. And they made this mock-up statue, and it looks so official. And Bette Davis had won several of them. And Ann Baxter wins it, and she holds it. You know, it's like a, a Lady Oscar, sort of, an Oscar. And, but there was no Sarah Siddons Award. So those smart people in Chicago started the Sarah Siddons Society about right after that movie, 1950, 51. And they modeled it after the, the other painting by Sarah Siddons, you know, just to show you how Romney, Romney and Gainsborough were, like Benedict said, the Matisse and the Picasso of the 1700s. Anyway, and they awarded a Sarah Siddons Award to Bette Davis, and they award one to Ann Baxter. So film followed life, or life followed film. I love your hat. And, I love your commentary about Barbie because it shows the total timelessness of Gainsborough. Thank you, I mean, not Vanna, I mean Barbie, for bringing Barbie and telling us about the fashion and the, and the eternal appeal of Thomas Gainsborough. In the next segment, Frank's Corner, we're going to talk about, we've got to get really serious here, we're going to talk about some serious money, what Gainsborough paintings have sold for at auction, and Benedict was talking about it earlier, maybe after these paintings, the most famous one by Thomas Gainsborough is Blue Boy. So we're going to talk about that in the next segment. Here we are at the very heart of the Cincinnati Art Museum, the Great Domed Area, and I thought this would be an appropriate spot for us to talk about Frank's Corner and Blue Boy that Benedict was talking about earlier. But take a good look here at the Cincinnati Art Museum. Talk about ambiance. This ambiance goes back to the 1880s. And you know, I have a theory that every great art museum needs a great staircase. The Cincinnati Art Museum has a great staircase. The Art Institute in Chicago has a fantastic staircase. And maybe you've seen that old mid-century movie with the great Audrey Hepburn where she glides down the stairway at the Louvre and the Wing Victory of Samuel Trace is in the background. So it's just fun to spend time at the art museum. But you know, Benedict was talking about our man today, Thomas Gainsborough, and it's very, very interesting to see how Thomas Gainsborough has come and gone, mostly gone up, in value at auction and everything like that. Now, Benedict was talking about perhaps the most famous painting ever of the Cincinnati Art Museum, the Ann Ford, that we talked about earlier, you know, the lady with the beautiful musical instrument. Well, the Blue Boy at one time was Gainsborough's perhaps most famous painting. And I, I found some information about it, which is really, really fun. And I just wanted to say on a sentimental note, I love this painting because it was my mother's favorite painting. And we had a reproduction in our house over the mantel in the living room. The Blue Boy was painted around 1770 in antique ease. They use the word circa, C-I-R-C-A. And it's considered, as I said, Gainsborough's masterpiece. Now, it descended through different owners, but here's the scandalous part of this. In 1921, 1921 it sold Lord Devine, this art dealer in London, sold it. Now, I think this is kind of funny. He said he sold it for 728,000, almost 729,000. The New York Times reported that it was really 640,000. Well, it doesn't matter which figure. That was a huge amount of money. And here was what everybody got upset in Britain. It was sold to an American, a Yankee, and his name was Henry Edwards Huntington. And you probably recognize him from his museum that he has out in California. Now, the books and stuff, when you do research, they say that $640,000 back then would be over $7.75 million today. I think that's a bunch of hooey, because I'll tell you where I'm coming up. In 1921, a seven-room house with a garage, 1921, could have been bought for $6,500. So roughly translated, what this gentleman paid for the Blue Boy could have bought a hundred houses. Now, seven, you know, upscale houses for back then. So that gives you an idea. At that time when Blue Boy sold, I got some more prices for you. Bacon was 10 cents a pound. And it was swift, it was upscale bacon. So anyway, 
that just gives you an idea about Blue Boy. And now, of course, that seems absolutely cheap because Jackson Pollock, you know, that abstract artist, in 2006, one of his paintings sold for $140 million. And we were talking earlier about Picasso. In 2004, one of his paintings sold for $104 million. So it's just very, very interesting how artists come and go. Van Gogh is in the big bucks and everything like that. It's really, really fun. And it would be fun to be able to look 80 years from now and be able to predict, because then we could all buy them low and sell them high and everything. But just remember that artists are just like movie stars. They come and go in popularity. And one more thing about Gainsborough. A couple of his more recent works have sold for close to $3 million at auction. So he kind of peaked out in the 1920s. I hope that you've enjoyed our visit at Gainsborough, uh, the great uh, artists of the 1700s in Britain that painted all these beautiful beautiful ladies, the demi-reps, as Benedict said, you know, they had sort of a quasi uh, reputation. But always go to art museums and uh, we're going to review in the next segment and just go over what we did. But just go to art museums to your heart content and you'll learn and you'll escape your daily cares. I can't believe how quickly the time has gone by today. I hope you've had as much fun as I have here at the Cincinnati Art Museum. And whenever you go out of town, just Google the town you're going to, Chicago, Memphis, Atlanta, and visit museums. And always remember to take the small tykes because that's starting them on a great habit as children to go museum hopping. And like I said earlier, I have such fond memories of going to the Art Institute of Chicago with my beloved grandmother. Great seeing the Renoir on the terrace. I hope you remember Gainsborough. He painted the beautiful, successful ladies of the 1700s. He was either the Matisse or the Picasso of the 1700s. I'll let you decide which one you want him to be. And also remember, like Barbara pointed out, how Gainsborough influenced fashions, and he still does with the big Gainsborough hat and everything for dirt. Derby Day down in Louisville, Churchill Downs. And it's interesting to see how paintings come and go in value and how other artists come along. But that's my message. Don't love a painting because you think it's valuable. And paintings are another form of antiques. Love paintings because you love them and they make you happy and they give you great vibes. Antiques are, include paintings. So I hope you have enjoyed Antique History in Loomis. Always remember to be chipper and see you the next time.